Well, I'm Gil Rosman, and it's my honor to moderate this session uh, with four distinguished panelists. I'll say a few introductory words and then proceed to introduce the panelists very briefly, since you all have uh, blurbs about them, and then we'll proceed right to the discussion itself. Uh, history repeats itself, we all have heard. Uh, but that's no reason when we talk about history, we have to repeat the same common arguments that we hear over and over again. So let's see if we can come up with some new ideas, some ways of conceptualizing and analyzing history that help us to move forward. And I'm not speaking as some kind of idealist that says, well, we, we can find a way to reverse what's happened in this, I would say, dreadful year for the revival of history. This is really a a troublesome year, and I'll say we've got uh, uh, Putin reverting to some previous period in Soviet or Russian history, as was mentioned this morning. We've got Xi Jinping turning the China dream into something that sounds more like uh, uh, something from China's past. And then, of course, we have um, Abe with his uh, effort to uh, take us back to the uh, uh, the, the war era with the repeated visits and references to the history. And, of course, we can, should not forget Kim Jong-un, who doesn't seem to have ever forgot the Korean War. So history is with us. And it's much of that is the history of the second quarter uh, of, the, of this past century, which was a pretty terrible time. And that's where we seem to be heading back to as... Uh, for rejuvenation of various countries. So I don't propose that we can try to reverse this course. I don't know if we can find a way to manage it. Um, maybe we can find a way to put it in a different context to deter some of its consequences. But above all, I think we have to find new ways as specialists on contemporary international relations to incorporate it, to conceptualize it, to interpret it in a broader context, which I would label national identities, going much beyond just nationalism to invoke this history or specific historical events. How does history fit into this wider context? At any rate, we have with us four uh, distinguished speakers. We start with uh, Dr. Chun Germain. Uh, the Dean of the School of International Relations and Public Affairs and a Professor of International Relations at Fudan University. Uh, he has published uh, on China, the United States, and Europe. And um, I think he comes from tradition of thinking broadly about international relations. And I'm delighted to have him here. Then we have Ralph Kossa, who's the President of Pacific Forum CSIS. And he, maybe more than anyone, has been bringing us the, uh, the background information on bilateral relations in East Asia uh, with comparative, comparative connections and other materials. And I think that his material is indispensable for understanding ongoing developments in, in the region. And then we have uh, Dr. Kim Ji-un, uh, who's a research fellow and the director of the Center for Public Opinion and Quantitative Research here at the Asan Institute. Uh, I've come to appreciate her work uh, enormously. I don't think anyone is doing more uh, timely and in-depth analysis of public opinion. And of course, that is driving much of the nationalist uh, discussion in the region. And finally, we have uh, uh, Ambassador and Professor um, Kazuhiko Togo, who um, is both a, a diplomat with uh, a great experience in dealing with history issues in the context of diplomacy, and also a scholar who's been exploring these issues and breaking new ground in ways that I don't think anyone else in the region has done nearly as comprehensively and nearly as innovatively. So it's a wonderful group to have here. We start with uh, Dr. Chen. Yep. Um, Thank you, um, Professor Roseman, and for the Aston Institute to invite me here. Um, first of all, I think I uh, would uh, uh, express our sorrow uh, for the lost and missing lives uh, in the uh, ferry uh, tragedy. 
uh, I think the Chinese at the moment are in a particular position to share the mood in, in Korea uh, as we are still uh, searching for the missing Malaysia airline MH371. Um, the tragic events echoed kind of a sober mood, uh, theme of today's conference. Uh, a sense of uh, decline, progressivism and op optimism uh, used to prevail I I since the end of the uh, Cold War and the rise of skepticism uh, over the last several years. Uh, I myself, I, I, I look at myself as a liberal realist. Uh, I still believe that uh, progressivism is what we need to sustain and pursue but also important for us to reflect, think through why skepticism is on the rise. Uh, so in doing so, we can uh, have efforts to uh, address the problems in our global and regional uh, system. Um, to start with, I would look at the three uh, views about back to future uh, from the academic community. Right? The first one, certainly, that was the uh, Professor Mia Shammer's prediction about back to future uh, for the post-Cold uh, War Europe. I think that for Professor Mia Shammer, that uh, the end of the Cold War means that you have more rivalry and conflicts in Europe because all the cooperation, integration, uh, country development in the Cold War was a result of bipolar structure. When the bipolar is gone, then cooperation is gone, right? But I think that uh, mostly he's wrong uh, because the European countries decided to embrace the unified Germany in a more integrated Europe. But he's not wrong on everything, right? We have seen on the periphery of the European Union uh, the bloodiest war since the uh, uh, Second World War uh, broke out in Yugo Yugoslavia, and now we have the uh, revived uh, Russia-West uh, conf con uh, confrontation. Um, the second view is uh, about uh, Fried, uh, Adam Friedman's, uh, you know, Europe's past as Asia's uh, future, right? So really predict, you know, uh, along the same lines, maybe uh, uh, like Mia Sharma, that uh, uh, rivalry, instability uh, would, would uh, dominate the regional international system. Uh, and I think that uh, when he sees the, uh, the developments in the, this region uh, over the last several years, he might have many reasons to say, yes, I told you so, right? Um, the third view is about, you know, uh, so-called Asia's past is Asia's future, right? David Kang is one of the uh, uh, scholars uh, discussing that uh, argument. Um, because in, in Asia, that uh, there has been a long time feature uh, a defining feature where China has been the central force in, in the international system. Uh, that China creates certainly a hierarchy uh, in the form of a unitary uh, tributary system, uh, but also uh, most often uh, maintained relative stability. Uh, so when China now uh, going back to his historical position, then uh, Chinese neighbors maybe uh, will more like to uh, accommodate rather than balance uh, because that is the normal things, right? Um, what we have seen in, in this regional institution, I feel, yes, there are something we can say that uh, there is a back of history, right? Uh, the uh, tensions in the region over history, over territorial, maritime territorial disputes are on the rise. Uh, that's certainly telling us whether the Europeans' past might be the Asia's future. On the other hand, China certainly is back. Uh, in 2010, China became the largest economy in the region, uh, and now it is equal to combined GDP of ASEAN plus Japan and Korea, uh, in just in three years later. Uh, on the military modernization plan, I think Chinese military power is also rising rapidly. Uh, is also moving towards a number one military power in East Asia in the near future. So the back of China as a number one power in the region certainly would raise the following question, what Asia's past be Asia's future? Uh, but for me, I think there's at least six reasons that uh, uh, what 
in, uh, allow us to argue that uh, it would be wrong to uh, argue that conflicts would prevail in East Asia, or China will be the dominating uh, power uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the region, as in the past. First of all, that is, the, the world of today is a live and let live a world where the sovereign states were protected by themselves and also by the international law. And secondly, I think the central focus or purpose of the state are now the survival of the state and welfare of its people. Uh, not so much about power and status, although power status is still an uh, important uh, purpose for the state. Uh, and thirdly is the achievement of this state purpose uh, through uh, the independent world. So states are increasingly bonded by each other. And fourthly, we have growing regional institutions, although everybody talk about the weak institutions in the region. Uh, and fifth, uh, I think this is a not isolate Asian uh, international system or East Asian international system. It is a system embedded in a global uh, uh, system where you have much more powers uh, uh, exist uh, in the region and from afar, right? Like the United States, India, uh, Russia. So the power balance in general will still be more balanced. And lastly, I would say the strategic culture, uh, strategic culture of a strong China. Uh, in the morning session, we talk about what China should look like another United States. Uh, I definitely say it. I would not say that China would want to be another United States. Uh, uh, certainly not the behavior. Uh, but Professor Yen Xunzong said that maybe we like uh, to have the same capacity of the United States. I, I don't think uh, that we should have uh, 10 uh, aircraft carriers uh, uh, for Chinese Navy, right? Um, but definitely China would not be uh, Canada. Uh, so the Americans would... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, won't. That, that won't happen, right? Uh, I, I think that uh, recently, we, after Crimea, we have seen that uh, the Americans, you want to do everything, and everything you think you are right. The Russians in the past, they opposed the American behavior. But now, they are following the American example. Uh, they would do also what Americans would do. Uh, I think that's still the Chinese. We, we oppose uh, certain things, but we still want to do what they uh, are doing uh, now. So, to conclude, uh, I think there are substantial mechanisms there to uh, promote stability and cooperation uh, in the region and to contain uh, the conflicts among, the, uh, among states. But uh, these mechanisms need to be improved and adapt to the changing context of today and future's world, uh, which means to, uh, how to manage the uh, disruptive developments in a sensitive power transition period uh, both uh, between the states and within the states, and find ways to have a China being uh, the number one uh, power in this uh, region, but not necessary as the dominant, dominating power uh, in, in, the, in the system. Uh, so smart diplomacy and also statecraft uh, is what, are what we needed and what has to be supplied. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ralph? Gil, well, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, of course, want to extend my deepest condolences to our Korean colleagues uh, as well, and, and also admire the incredible bravery of the young people who are out there diving into this very treacherous waters looking for remains. I think we shouldn't overlook the great bravery of these, of these people and their dedication. Uh, this is a, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, it's one that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, all too often, uh, East Asia history is a code word for let's beat up on Japan for World War II. Uh, and I, I would like to talk a little bit about Japan, obviously, but I thought I would start by talking just very, very briefly about American history uh, in Asia. Uh, given what I seem to hear as a lot of apprehension or insecurity about U.S. commitment and the pivot and et cetera, et cetera, despite the fact that uh, President Obama is on his way to, to Asia today. Uh, it's, it's useful to remember that the United States has been involved in Asia since before we had a West Coast. 
Uh, we may not be an ancient society like many of the ones here, but we have been around for a couple hundred years. Uh, and our involvement in Asia goes almost back to uh, conception. Uh, and certainly uh, the U.S. has been a, a player in, in, in Asia, at least for the last century or so. Uh, I think we learned a lesson of history uh, before, World War, or before the Korean War. Uh, and that lesson, which uh, has been learned and, and uh, we have acted accordingly, was don't send false signals. Uh, make sure that if you are committed, that you send very uh, clear signals of commitment. And I think that's been the case. Uh, um, some of you have heard my standard pitch on the pivot, and I won't go into that now, but I will uh, remind everyone that uh, people were convinced after the Vietnam War that the U.S. was going to leave. We didn't. Uh, after the Cold War, after the Asian financial crisis, uh, et cetera, et cetera, after Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, but the reality is the U.S. presence in Asia is driven by U.S. national security interests, uh, and, and that's going to continue. Uh, and the so-called pivot, if you will, uh, began with the Bush administration, with the H.W. Bush administration in 1989, when we recognized the Asia-Pacific century, the 21st century, uh, and our interests lie here. China, quite frankly, was an afterthought uh, in, in 1989. It was only a threat to itself, as you may recall. So the, this whole shift toward Asia has been driven very much by national interests, and I would, I would expect that it would continue, and that's America's history in, in Asia, if you would. So let's now talk about uh, Northeast Asia history. Uh, I think the, the first thing that I would like to stress is that history did not end in 1945. Uh, and when I travel through the area, so often it seems to me that everybody thinks that or talks about history only in terms of that 1930 to 1945 period. Uh, and uh, there's a wonderful old proverb about forget the past and lose an eye, dwell on the past and lose both eyes. Uh, and I think it's time to sort of remember both the good and the bad past uh, and not dwell uh, just on, on the wrong part. There's also, we've heard a bunch of different sayings about history and the thesauruses are full of thousands of them. One of my favorite ones comes from Mark Twain. Uh, and he points out that a cat having sat on a hot stove will never sit on a hot stove again. It will also never sit on a coal stove. <laughs> and the, the moral is that you've only got to draw the right lessons out of history and not just, you know, uh, sort of over overgeneralize. Uh, and, and I think it's Im important today that we have a debate on history, uh, but I think it needs to be a much broader debate. Uh, I would, as advice to my Japanese colleagues, uh, I think it's time for Mr. Abe to play the history card, uh, but not the history card he's been playing. That one needs to be put back in the deck. He has said definitively that he accepts the Moriyama statements and the Kono statements, let's move on. Anytime he's asked a question about history, he should repeat those sentences. Then he should say, let's talk about history. Let's talk about Japan's history since 1945. Let's talk about the rise of Japan from a devastated war-ravaged country to, at one point, the second largest economy in the world. The lead goose, if you will, remember those analogies. Where would Korea be today? Where would China be today had it not been for that economic development in Asia that started with the Japanese and then went on to the Five Tigers and then went on uh, ultimately to China? Uh, and we sort of forget about that historical role. What country uh, in the second half of the 20th century has a better track record uh, than Japan in helping its neighbors and insisting, uh, assisting its neighbors and also in being committed to non-use of force as a, as a means to uh, settle disputes. And uh, you know we need to sort of stress that. But there's another important thing, and, and we heard a little bit about the Thucydides trap uh, this morning and the inevitable clash uh, between a rising power and an established power. Well, guess what, folks? In the second half of the 20th century, Japan rose and Germany rose. And they both rose, not in competition with the established power, but in cooperation with the established power. And no one talked about a clash 
There were a couple of silly books about the coming war with Japan and et cetera, et cetera. But, but the reality is that we created an environment where a rising power could rise within the system. That's exactly what we've been trying to do with China. That's what the US has been doing, that's what Japan's been doing, that's what Europe's been doing, creating this interdependence so that China in the 21st century will rise the way Japan and Germany did in the second half of the 20th century as opposed to uh, the first half of the 20th century. And that to me is the real lesson of, of history that we sort of forget, uh, that uh, peaceful rise is, is in fact uh, possible. So where, where, do we, where do we go from here uh, in, in the two minutes uh, remaining? Uh, I, I think that uh, I would like to see uh, Mr. Abe give a speech. Uh, and here's what I'd like him to say. I'd like him to say, we understand that there are territorial disputes uh, in Asia. We believe, Japan believes that the Northern Territories and Takashima belong to Japan. However, we recognize, we acknowledge the fact that they are both in others' hands. Northern territories are controlled by the Russians and Dokto is in Korean hands. Since we have renounced the use of force to settle disputes, uh, we understand that this has to be done peacefully and until then we have to recognize the reality on the ground. We call on our Chinese colleagues regarding Senkaku's to acknowledge the same thing. But while you may ha believe that those islands belong to you, the truth on the ground today is that they are in Japanese hands and you need to acknowledge that and renounce the use of force as we have with Korea and with Russia. Now my question would be, how would Koreans react to that? Would they focus on the first half of the sentence which says, this island are ours? Or would they focus on the important part which says, but we have renounced the use of force and we acknowledge your administrative control. Uh, control. Mm -hmm. If Korea chooses to focus on the second part, then I think we move forward. Uh, if all too often Korea has tended to focus on the first part and then that just takes us down uh, a path which I think is very unhelpful. The other, the other very quick point, uh, I was impressed by uh, uh, Yoon byung say. Uh, this morning and many of the things he said, but I was very curious. He made the comment, if North Korea conducts another nuclear test, that's a game changer. Uh, what does that mean and how will we change the game? Well, I would think that one thing that Japan and Korea could be doing to change the game would be to announce in advance that if there's another nuclear test, that the Korean and Japanese combined response will be to move forward with the JASOMIA, with the, the Intelligence Exchange Agreement, and the AXA, the Ac Acquisition and Cross Servicing Agreements, and then call on China to also join the PSI. If you, know, you recall again history, Korea before the second nuclear test said, if North Korea tests, we will join the PSI. North Korean said, if you do that, we'll attack and everything. They tested, you joined, we all lived happily ever after. So to me, these are the types of lessons that we can, we can learn from history in dealing with North Korea and in dealing with one another. Thank you. Thank you. And you? Well, first, first of all, thank you, Gail, for the really friendly introduction. And this is my first time presentation at the plenum, and this is my first time um, to be on the big stage in this Regency Hall, so it's my debut. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a number person, as I introduced, so I uh, deal with the data and the numbers every single day, and I can actually confirm that those rising concern about the tensions uh, in the region is actually concrete. Um, we do the surveys and how the pe people feel about the countries, neighboring countries, and the people's favorability scores toward Japan is hit the rock bottom in March. And it was even lower than that of North Korea. And much more shockingly, the favorability score toward um, the Prime Minister Abe was also lower than that of Kim Jong-un. Um, so at this point, um, it is a warranted question and the criticism that um, strong nationalism in the region and it is um, bringing all those history debates to the fore and uh, it also prevents the, the strategic um, thinking and the cooperating with each other countries and I'd like to discuss this in, uh, from the perspective of the Korean public because that's um, my job and to, to read the public. 
uh, first the nationalism in Korea and the people's uh, sentiment and opinion toward Japan uh, or the, uh, how they view about the relationship with Japan. And also, I'd like to check if the history is really in the middle as an obstacle between two countries. I mean, in a nutshell, the Korean public and the, the characteristics of the nationalism of Korean people is actually changing. I mean, you may remember that the 2002 World Cup games and all the, the countless people are wearing red shirts and pouring out in Seoul City Hall Square and they're rooting for the soccer players. And that was actually the memories that might have left you that um, somewhat dramatically and maybe too strong ethnic um, nationalistic image of Korea. Um, but well, I like to emphasize that of course, we are still patriotic, we are still nationalistic, and we still root for the Korean soccer players. But the characteristic of the nationalism of Korea has changed dramatically. Um, it's to be exact, the national, um, ethnically nationalistic Korean image is largely disappearing after 12 years. Um, according to my recent studies, the sharing the Korean, like ethnic components, like sharing the Korean bloodline, you have to live in Korea for the most of your life, and also you have to be born in Korea. These all ethnic components are much less substantial and important things to Korean people in order to be Korean. It is rather the following and the keeping the Korean system, rule of law, and the Korean linguistic abilities, and also to understand and follow the Korean culture and the values. These are civic components are much more important things to a lot of Koreans. And that tendency is uh, much more clear uh, among the young generation and with a, um, very understandable reasons. And so I think um, it deserves some more attention because the Korean nationalism has been a lot of times intertwined with the ethnic nationalism. And a lot of scholars agree that ethnic Korean nationalism of Korea was actually, um, you know, stemming from uh, to protest, um, ag protest against the racial discrimination under the, the Japanese colonial rule. So it is rather um, about you know, becoming a good citizen of the state and the society in order to be a Korean, but not really the ethnically bonded or you have to be uh, born in Korea. So it's, uh, the, it's the Korean national identity is under the huge transformation, and I predict it's going to be um, uh, more and more so as time goes by. So you don't have to be necessarily obsessed with uh, sharing all the ethnic homogeneity and you know, the share the, the painful or, or glorious past, or that you have to be bounded in territorial boundaries. And having said that, it, uh, begets to another change, like a people's attitude toward looking at Japan, looking at China, looking at the U.S. and the relationship too, because the history debates um, very much relate to uh, Japan. I just need to mention about Japan. Um, maybe you might be surprised because I just often mentioned that uh, people's favorability toward Japan is really low, but most Koreans still would like to forge the relationship with Japan. I mean, according to the Asan Daily Poll, conducted between February 23rd and 25th in 2014, please remember, this is right after the Takeshima Day, 68% um, Koreans still, uh, still approve that we have to improve the relationship with Japan. And 63% of Koreans said well, President Park Geun-hye should be more proactive to forge the relationship or improve the relationship with Japan. And 54%, 59, actually 55% of them understood still the necessity of the summit between the two countries. And on all questions, a young generation much more supportive of the, the improving the relationship with Japan and all the efforts to, should be done. And I know that in the Washington DC, uh, there's some concern, growing concern about the uh, trilateral alliance and how, how are we going to deal with it if the, once the Korea, Japan does continue to be like that. But only the 30% of Koreans actually put the security cooperation with China over the trilateral alliance between Korea, US, and Japan. And in December 2013, right after the Prime Minister Abe's Yasukuni visit, still 51% of Koreans actually supported GSOMIA with Japan. And when Secretary Kerry visited Korea last February, he mentioned that South Korea should think strategically and should look forward to the future and put the past behind. And mass media actually, in Korea actually reported that it's maybe a little bit insensitive comments made by Secretary Kerry, but in fact, 59% actually almost 60% of Korean P 
people agree to the statement. So what more can you expect the Korean people to be rational and strategically think than that? So all in all, um, there's no glimpse of proof to claim that um, Koreans are blinded by ethnic nationalism and memories of a colonial history and the hatred to Japan uh, and the fail to think strategically, I, have, I like to emphasize. And also having said that, um, it's been a big government that continuously brought up the enforced sex slave issues in histories uh, in a very disgraceful way. And, and they also mentioned that Kono's statement to be re-examined and then retreated and then said again. And the renowned public figures, and including Osaka Mayor Hashimoto, um, who said the sex slave, um, they're a necessary part of war and it was done involuntarily. Um, I think it's not just uh, distorting the fact, but also dis, uh, dis, uh, degrading the human nature. And also the Abe government, the stir of the old Yasukuni shrine that the dispute and then where the 14 class A war criminals are enshrined. So I'd like to ask who is bringing up the history at this point? And I can assure you, so believe me, as much as the Japanese public is fatigued of an apology thing, but Korean people are also very much fatigued of <laughs> the repetition of the regrets and also repeats of the regrets made by the Japanese government. Mm -hmm. And let me introduce the one last statistics. Um, among the issues hindering the relations between the Korea and Japan, it was Tokdo, not the history. 42% of Koreans actually said the Tokdo issue is the, most, um, the biggest obstacle between two countries. Um, and of course, I'm not saying that uh, history issue is off the table completely because 33% of Koreans actually said that the history textbook taught in the secondary schools of Japan is also problematic. And I actually think it, it gives them some answer of this plenum that the, if the history is not dealt with correctly, it's going to, the future of history is going to be the history. Um, my last comment is that maybe we can learn some lessons from the history. Just <coughs> if we do, um, if we do not avoid it, but just to face it. And maybe the, we keep saying that whether or not history repeats itself, and because, well, quote, what experience and history teaches us, that people in government never have never learned anything from the history or acted on the principles deduced from it, unquote. And once and for all, I hope the Hegel is incorrect. Well, thank you, and let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, Kazu. <coughs> thank you. Uh, I think I am bound to agree that uh, history has come back to the three countries in a very unfortunate manner. But then we have to, uh, we have to understand how it came back. First, about Japan. So it's about Abe about whom we have already discussed <laughs> quite extensively. Uh, Abe, after his initial success of Abenomics last year, uh, in uh, June, after his uh, victory of the House of Councillors election, was in a position to tackle his political agenda, the, the key phraseology being getting out from post-war post -war regime. Getting out from post-war regime. What does it mean? This is a difficult issue, even for Japanese. It's not easy to grasp what I think. I, and I'm trying to explain it from three perspectives. First, getting out from irresponsible and selfish pacifism. And second, getting out from unworthy and undue humiliation. And third, getting out from egocentric society, lacking respect for real public values, in where profit and loss, sontoku, the strange Japanese, profit and loss only play a decisive role. And as the situation stood uh, in autumn last year, my understanding that Abe is now going to tackle the first agenda. And as for the second agenda, my understanding <laughs> and expectation that Abe is going to freeze it. Why? Because already the experience shown in, 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 sp in spring last year uh, shows that this issue is a very, very, very difficult issue. If you want to tackle it, at least you, have, you must have an understanding of how other countries perceive this issue. And that includes Korea, China, and the United States. And so I thought that there has been enough learning experience 
to freeze it. Now, I think I was right in uh, understanding the first agenda will be tackled. Uh, this, is, this, is, this has become one of the most important domestic political agenda, the question of re changing the interpretation of Article 9. I was completely wrong on the second agenda. Uh, against my expectation, against my advice, Abe went to Yasukuni on the 26th of December last year, which really proved to be a diplomatic disaster, which only exalted the Chinese hardliners which distanced Korea and which really anguished and angered the United States. So, in a way, history came back in a most unfortunate, to put it mildly, <laughs> in a most un unfortunate manner. Now, how about Korea? Looking from Japan, post-war Korean development is just a uh, 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 source of admiration. Korea uh, d developed its economy from one of the poorest to one of the most powerful economy in East Asia. Korea built its democracy of his, its own. And in the last uh, decade or so, Korea is mesmerizing the outside world with the Korean cultural waves. Under usual circumstance, success creates confidence. And confidence creates an ability to accept uh, others. But in case of uh, Korea and Japan, I think things are turning into a complete opposite direction. And the, 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 the political climate which surrounds Japan and Korea is, is as low as ever, lower than ever. There are five issues which separate us, lack of confidence between the top leaders, uh, comfort one issue, Takeshima Dokuto issue, uh, the Korean Supreme Court verdict on, uh, on uh, forced labor, and lastly, the Yasukuni issue, which was added uh, at the end of last year. Uh, why? Why is that? Now, if you look at the political message which come from, from the media or through the media, there is a certain growing impression in Japan that the confidence in Korea is now unleashing the deep-rooted Korean anger against Japanese colonization. And even in this world of rising China, this might have certain uh, reminiscence of uh, asserting Korean superiority over Japan in the traditional Sinocentric world. Now, for China, again, four decades of China's rise was a source of admi admi ad admiration. Um, uh, economic rise, turning into political rise, and turning into military rise, now turning into, uh, into cultural rise. But, but if this, particularly the military rise, signifies that China is ready to use military forces in order to, in order to uh, uh, ascertain its position on the uh, territorial issues in Northeast China Sea and South China Sea, then this is nothing but a reflection of hegemonism and a turning back of uh, China into the 19th century uh, imperialism. You know, what to do? What to do? What to do? Uh, I think there are certain, uh, sort of, in my world, quick fix approach that each party will ex ex exert a little more restraint. We have talked about Abe. Yes, Abe's position from December uh, 20th last year has changed a little bit. On, with, on Korea, uh, his position on comfort woman changed, and uh, uh, as Ralph Koza mentioned, he underlined that the Murayama statement will be, will be protected. Fine. Yeah. I, I was so glad to hear uh, from Professor Koza. I really hope, I really hope that that is going to become his unwavering position from now onwards. Uh, now that uh, Japan has uh, launched certain signal to t discuss about comfort women, I think that Korea has a real responsibility to cut this ball and do something about it between Prime Minister Abe and President Park. I think President Park needs to exert certain uh, political leadership to do this. For China, if China, as Professor uh, Koda mentioned, if China refrains from using forces 
and uh, limit itself in asserting its position on territorial issues, both on North and the South China Sea, that will change uh, substantially the, 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 the psychology in this, re in this region. But my own recipe, my own recipe goes slightly beyond this. My <laughs> major point is, is to find, try to find the, 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 the real root causes of these changes. And I think this is related to the question of rise of China. And I was very interested to hear uh, Professor Yen's concluding statement this morning when we have discussed this, uh, uh, this, uh, these issues from realist point, uh, point of view. Then uh, Professor Yen stated in the concluding statement that uh, uh, China wants to bring in be 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 better policy to this problem, but with uh, borrowing the wisdom from ancient Chinese uh, thinking. <sighs> this is interesting. This is interesting. Uh, the, so in my view, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the co key issue which the world faces is that China is seeking to establish a new world order going beyond the established Eurocentric world, Eurocentric world order, based on Greek philosophy, Christianity, industrial revolution, and Euro-American values of democracy and law. If that is the case, why does not China seek to establish a new world order with all its civilizational values, but encompassing some of the best of Western values of democracy and rule of law? Why cannot Korea, in this rising age of new Sinocentrism, act as a bridge between China and Japan, not from the position of superiority over Japan, but from the position of truly equitable partner among the three? Why cannot Japan reorient it itself with a new civilizational vision of its own, just like it did for 260 years in the Edo period, but now under an entirely different openness in the age of globalization. And I, have, I want to bring in one example, which is An chung -gun, but I leave the chairman when to say this. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I will. Thank you very much. Okay, we now turn to a couple of questions I will ask quickly. I know we don't have a lot of time. We have a panel of four members, so I'll ask these questions two by two, to, uh, for t two quick responses, please, uh, from each group, and then we'll talk, open it up to the floor. On the, the, for the, the China-Japan relationship, our first two speakers, I want to raise the question of how the history of Japan as a peaceful country or a militarized country plays out. Ralph brought up the point that we should remember the good and the bad. Does China remember the peaceful nature of Japan from 1945 until at least recently? China wants to interpret the last two years as different. Does China have a major part of its interpretation of Japanese history this period? Or is China seeing Japan only in, from the bad without uh, demonizing it? And I want both of you to comment on this issue of militarization as a theme in history. Uh, Dr. Chen? Yeah, I, I think that certainly the Chinese will remember that uh, Japan after the defeat in the Second World War that uh, being uh, not a really military power has not been using uh, the forces around uh, but that was bonded by the, the Constitution. Um, but the Chinese, I think, are mostly concerned about the recent development, right? That the, the strengthening of the military and strengthening the alliance with the, the United States and try to now start to uh, lift the ban of the exports of the military uh, weapons or weapon technology. So the trend is concerned the Chinese. I think that. Uh, uh, when you are seeing that also in the Chinese like um, movies or TVs and you see a lot of things focusing that part and, and then focus on the war experience, not so much you know, on, on the, the, the good times in our relations, right? So yeah, that's the, um, um, the attention point. Uh, Thank you. Ralph? Yeah, Gil, it's a wonderful question. I I think that it's extremely sloppy scholarship and even sloppier journalism when people equate Japanese nationalism with Japanese militarism or militarization. Uh, 
yes, uh, Abe is a nationalist, and quite frankly, Japan has a lot to be proud of if you look at its history for the last 50 or 60 years. But this idea that somehow or other Japan exploring collective self-defense is remilitarization of, of Japan. I mean, look at the numbers, folks. Korea has three times the size military as Japan. China has 10 times the size military of Japan. Uh, Japan has an incredibly large military budget to maintain an extremely small force. So do the math, lay out on a piece of paper the size of a Japanese military that could threaten even South Korea, much less threaten a Japan with 2.3 million men in the army and, and nuclear weapons, and then figure out how much that would cost. Unless China's prepared to loan Japan the money, <laughs> uh, there, I mean, there's no way that Japan could militarize. Collective self-defense is, is a very simple concept. And it comes home to someone like me who's worked in, in the military uh, on this, and I've been in exercises. Uh, if the North Koreans fire a missile at Japan, Japan can shoot it down. But if North Korea fires a missile at my home in Hawaii, Japan has to wave and watch it go by because that would be collective self-defense. Uh, if a North Korean aircraft is about to attack a U.S. or a Korean aircraft in the Sea of Japan in the East Sea, and Japan has an AWACS on scene that could provide information about it, it is, by today's constitution, prohibited from doing that. That's collective self-defense. That is what we're looking at for Japan to be a, a greater ally. That serves Korea's interest. It doesn't threaten Korea's interest. And yet, I was here in Korea when the 2 plus 2 meeting was going on in Japan, and I kept being asked, why is the United States supporting Japanese remilitarization? Uh, again, let's, let's understand what remilitarization is and isn't. Let's understand what collective defense is and isn't. Uh, what kind of a Japanese military would threaten China today? Uh, and, and how could they possibly build that? They can't even maintain the size force that they have given the shrinking population and et cetera. Thanks. Okay. The, the second question uh, to ji and Kazu, based on your final point, Kazu, about uh, the Korean hero, An, who assassinated Ito Hirobumi, and that is, if Korea is not really be focusing on history issues, it's focusing only on territorial issue, why has this symbol of An been played up with, Chinese cooperation. Is there, in Japan they have an image that Korea is embracing Chinese history and denigrating Japanese history. So do we have any public opinion data to help us understand that? And Kazu, please explain further about that too. Okay. Um, no, we don't have public opinion data on that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of Korean people are very supportive and uh, very thankful to the Chinese government um, action on the um, Anjung-gun. Um, but um, it's my personal feeling as a pollster, I've been working in this field for a while, that I don't really think that this was a big issue in Korea. And this is also part of it. And then we all know very well that Chinese government are reacting that way because we are in a very delicate situation among the, uh, between the Korea, uh, Korea, Japan, and China, and the United States. And we understand that very well. And then uh, as I, the poll shows that, um, even though it has a really good um, gesture from Chinese government, it's not the first time. I mean, he sent a message to the President Park Geun-hye for the, the birthday uh, um, celebration. Um, and then but we understand that is where it's coming from and uh, where uh, it is aiming at. So it was well received by the Korean public, but it's not a critical issue in Korea. And if I may, the add a little bit about the public opinion to the Japan, uh, Japan's militarization. And of course, a lot of Korean people feel uncomfortable with that, and almost 80% of people are opposed to that. And the data shows that when the Secretary Kerry supported the Collective Self-Defense Force uh, in October, and the people's um, attitude to, toward not just Japan, but also toward the, uh, the U.S. has decreased, declined a little bit. But I would like to assure that this is not because we are scared of or the feared or afraid of Japan to become another military strong country. 
but it is just very uncomfortable with the fact because it's not really the history is resolved or the, uh, the Abe administration actually admitted that what has happened and also confirmed. But, and then they are doing it without acknowledging it. And that only makes the Korean people very uncomfortable. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we are scared. Because we've seen that Japan was up and also so the Japan is down, particularly so for the young generation. Yes. Uh, I agree that uh, this issue may not be one of the major issues between Japan and Korea. I did not include it in the five issues I mentioned. But I think this is very symbolic that how history, which is shallowly, shallowly understood now, destroys some of the most important aspects of our relationship. You see, An chung even at the time when he assassinated Ito Hirobumi and was executed half a year later, in Japan, there were a sizable number of people who respected him, who considered him, uh, uh, who considered him as a patriot, worthy of high uh, respect. And the most striking example is the friendship which emerged between his prison guard, Chiba Jushiti, and An. Uh, Chiba Jushiti, by being impressed by An's uh, personality, apologized to him. An, An, Chung, An, An was uh, uh, first surprised but then told Chiba that the, your mission is to, uh, is to do what you, what, what you have to do. And in the morning of his ex execution, uh, An left his last calligraphy to Chiba, outlining, saying that to devote to one country is true mission of a soldier. And uh, Chiba, after An's ex execution, went back to Japan, carried this calligraphy as, as his personal and family treasure. Many Japanese, who, 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 who hear this story comes to tears. Amazingly, uh, Ambassador Okazaki Hisahiko, who is known to be the mentor on foreign policy to Prime Minister Abe, when he served in Seoul 30 years ago, discovered An An's personality and An's uh, greatness. And he uh, told about his discovery to Japanese visitors and to the American visitors, all of them became An Chung Un's ad ad admirers. And lastly, the, the key message from one of the key messages which was left by An was the creation of East Asian community. Community between Korea, China, and Japan, comprising common bank, common uh, 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 police forces, and shared cultural values. Now, against this background, what has happened in Harbin last year, uh, 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 last year or so? really breaks my heart. Rather than, rather than uh, bringing An as a, as a tying, tying knot of the three countries, the museum is, is now uh, to, to trying to show uh, the, 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 the cooperation between China and Korea against Japan, in a, put it in a nutshell. <laughs> my heart is broken. But I think uh, it's An chung -un himself who, who would most lament how that relationship is developing to this direction. Ralph, a quick comment, if you wish. Yeah, I, what I found fascinating in this history debate is if you look over the course of history, China has invaded the Korean Peninsula at least as many times as, as Japan has. Uh, and unless I missed it, the last military to invade the Korean Peninsula <laughs> and to divide it was the Chinese. Uh, and the Chinese PLA now celebrates the 50th, the 60th, the 65th anniversary of the liberation of the Korean Peninsula. So it, it seems like our Korean friends have a very selective memory of history uh, and sort of demand the 20th apology from Japan, but have not yet asked for the first one <laughs> from China. And that just seems to have double standards. Dr. Chen. Yeah. But I think it's uh, firstly, uh, it's um, about the, the Japanese uh, mi military development. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, the size really matters. You know, the Americans has a much less uh, si smaller size of the army uh, of China, but uh, you are the number one and you can operate around the world, do a lot of things uh, um, around the world. Um, and, you know, 
the Japanese Navy, a lot of people say, oh, even in Japan, right, the Navy officer will say that they might in two hours destroy the Chinese Navy. Oh, that, that represents, you know, a small but high quali quality army uh, there. So the other thing is about the, um, uh, you know, the so-called collective defense. Uh, I think the Koreans and the Chinese, uh, we concern that, is that the assumption behind it. Uh, you assume that in the case of North Korea firing a missile against the United States, then Japan should shoot it down, right? Uh, we have remembered that uh, now in, in Russia, in Black Sea, you're sending an Aegis uh, anti-missile uh, destroyer uh, to the Black Sea. Uh, you're telling the Russians that these are not for, these are the, you know, destroyers, anti-missile system, is for the Iranians, right? And now, finally, you're sending to Black Sea, right? That's for Russia. So I think that in China, deep suspicion that all these things are based on the assumption that there's one day there could be a U.S.-China. Uh, so, and you want Japan on your side. So I, I would say, you know, if you don't uh, let the Chinese to release that kind of suspicion, certainly China will be strong position to oppose Japan to have that, uh, you know, uh, collective defense. Uh, and certainly for the uh, Korean War, and I think that uh, we have settled the issue with uh, South Korea, uh, so uh, why not the United States are so obsessed with that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we are open to questions. We'll take three questions and then uh, ask the panelists to respond and then go through another round. Over here, there's a question. Yeah. Please announce who you are your identification, and then ask a quick question. Only one question, please. All right, Stefano, uh, Seoul Village. Uh, raise the question of uh, the uh, potential mission of uh, Park Geun-hye, and does, doesn't she have an historic opportunity, if not uh, obligation, to set the example, and maybe to, through reviving uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or, and to really uh, facing Korean own recent history uh, very clearly and strongly, then she could not only uh, reconcile uh, Koreans together again, but also reach not uh, to Japan with a much stronger uh, weight. And uh, she wouldn't change Shinzo Abe, but she could really appeal to the Japanese people uh, because typically uh, the sex slavery issue is not a question about Japan versus Korea. It's about Japan versus Japan, and really uh, the, qu the question Abe is, uh, is asking his own people is to choose between loyalty to post-war Pacific Japan and uh, loyalty to Imperial Japan war crimes. Thank you. Uh, over there, a question. Uh, I'm Dr. Yao Yun Zhu from the Academy of Military Science, China. My question is posed to uh, Ralph Kosa, my good friend. Um, you have given us a very uh, vivid description of what the uh, collective defense means if Japan has or has not such a right to uh, collective defense. So my question is that if you can, um, in the same descriptive way, uh, explain or interpret in the uh, possible military conflict across the Taiwan Strait and in the case that uh, United States is going to intervene because of the uh, Taiwan Relations Act, you have a certain kind of, mi of defense commitment to Taiwan and is there any difference that uh, w what kind of what Japan can do or cannot do if, if it has the collective defense or if it has not the collective defense right. A, th a third question back there. Wait, wait a minute. Okay, my question goes to the Professor Kuzihiko. And my name is Jie Jong Lee and uh, I'm from the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat. When I say trilateral, it's uh, not US, uh, 
Japan and Korea is China, Japan, and Korea. And when we uh, do the public survey about the uh, public sentiment of the, these three people, and this is a you know, study from the university student, and the question goes to the Korean and the Chinese student. Do you think the Japanese did enough apology for the you know, past history? 80, close 90% of students say no, they have not. But uh, when you ask the same question to the Japanese that we have done enough of apology and how many times we have to repeat it, this kind of apology, and has done from the 70s, 80s, and still in, in, in the process. Do you think what would be the, the sort of uh, equilibrium of the uh, difference of gap between the two Japanese, uh, Japanese people and Korean Chinese people Meeting that whether there is enough, uh, you know, apologies and uh, reconciliation. Okay. Let's start with the, f the second question, Ralph, uh, on the collective self-defense issue. All right. Well, I mean, first of all, I couldn't possibly uh, tell you what Japan would do in a situation like that, uh, but I can't imagine China using military force against Taiwan uh, in this day and age. Uh, so I, it's a very, very hypothetical question. I would assume that if China, for whatever reason, decided that it was going to use military force against Taiwan, that the U.S. would be compelled to respond, and that response would be a military, a political, and an economic response, and we would look to Japan to provide support to that. I don't think the U.S. would require or look for Japan to actually provide military forces, uh, but I think that there would be probably economic consequences. It certainly would have an impact on the amount of investment in China on the you know, 10 million J Chinese jobs that are right now in Japanese companies in, in China. So there, the, the consequences uh, would, would be, I think, severe, and, and the most severe consequences might very well be the political and economic uh, rather than just the military. So I, but again, uh, unless you know something that I don't, I don't think China's planning on starting a war with Taiwan anytime soon. So uh, hopefully we, this, this will remain just a very academic debate. Mm -hmm. uh, Jiyun, do you want to respond about Park's special role for reconciliation? Um, well, this is actually the part that I'm kind of um, dissatisfied with the President Park and her policy toward Japan because from my um, point of view, I think she needs to clearly describe what we can handle and what we can expect from Japan and what we want from Japan. But it seems like she's just avoiding all those things and just a reaction. And actually, it just does not give some frustration to Japan and China and the US, but also is giving the frustration to the Korean public. It's not just the fatigue of the policy and the thinking, but the Korean people actually are tired of you know, looking at the government, the Korean government. The, um, and also the Korean public too, we are listening the same thing at the same time, that the Japanese provocation and those comments and then get mad and angry and reaction. So maybe what um, the, it's, I'm not really sure whether or not the President Park has made a decision, but what we would like to see actually is just manage it, just resolve it, whatever that is, and just do not avoid it, which is not the solution, obviously, because it can show that you know, those of the 45% of people you know, who supported the summit between the two countries, more than 60 people actually wanted uh, the President Park to meet the Prime Minister Abe to resolve the history and uh, resolve and also discuss the history issues. So, you know, the, where we have to start. Um, and then, I don't know whether or not that the question was um, at me, but the, if I just briefly say that where can we make a equilibrium, the one part that thinks it's enough of apology, the other part thinks it's we haven't heard on it, uh, enough of apology, um, I think is how sincere the apology was. And you know, so as a woman, I understand the kind of situation that when we are uh, the women and men in fight, um, the men say, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And it's very different from, okay, I'm really sorry. You know? <laughs> um, and then it kind of relates to the pattern of habits. I mean, we heard that, okay, they regret, and then they say the, some different things, they repeatedly. And then that actually, as I said, you know, the Japanese people are fatigued and tired of saying oh, sorry, but also Korean people are really sick and tired of just listening, the hearing, <laughs> the, I'm sorry, okay, kind of attitude. Kasu, do you want to add to this apology business? Uh, I think I got two, two questions. One, 
Uh, if I have understood you cor correctly, then you mentioned that the comfort woman issue is Japan-Japan issue. Correct? Japan-Japan. I don't think so. It, it, it is not a Japan-Japan issue, but there's clearly a dimension of Japan-Korea issue. And this, I don't have time to go to the whole history of what happened in the 1990s and uh, 2000s, but there has been genuine effort by the best of the Japanese liberals, based on the Kono statement, in the form of the, of the activities of, of Asian women fan, in accordance with which Japan politically at least, has resolved this issue of, of comfort women on all pertinent countries, that includes Netherlands, Philippines, Taiwan, and Indonesia. With Korea, we were unable to do this. My position is that the two sides have to continue to do effort, particularly quickly. While the 52 comfort women are still alive in Korea, we need to come to some kind of political solution, but for this, Efforts are needed from both sides. Now, to answer your question, that 80% of the Chinese and Korean students consider that Japan has not done enough. Well, <laughs> uh, my, my conclusion, I think that efforts are needed in both sides. On our side, for instance, the total lack of education on teaching, even the minimum of the Japan's post uh, uh, post uh, major history. This is criminal to the Japanese student. We, there has to be min minimum education so that we shall remember, at least remember, of what has happened. But on the Korean side and, and uh, on Chinese side, well, just one example. I, I taught at the Seoul National University for, for uh, four months, several years ago. I went to the uh, Setaimon, what's the <laughs> this, this famous uh, prison, prison, huh? Sademon, Sademon, yeah. Uh, with two of my students on a Sunday morning, uh, Saturday morning, where it was full of Korean uh, gra grammar school students. And all of you know the image of atrocity, image of atrocity committed by the Japanese uh, soldiers during occupation. Now, some of them may be true, but to, to, to plant this image of atrocity particularly to women, blood in their face, from that, from that age of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the gra grammar school. Even if Japan was prepared to remember, even if Japan was prepared to continue its apology, there will be deeply grounded indignation among the Korean students from that age. So I left the museum with a sense of despair. But you know, my Korean student told, told me, well, Professor Togo, don't worry too much because we were educated in this environment and now we love Japan. So, you know, this is a very complex situation. <laughs> so both sides have to do some effort, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we will follow the pattern of the first session. We have almost no time. So we'll get uh, final quick questions, uh, less than a minute each, and then we will uh, see if we get a few seconds for responses. Over there, please. Yes. <laughs> so big questions, actually. And we're talking a lot about histories, but the problems, uh, what we're familiar with, and the history is real one. And uh, because you see the history has been imbued with passions, emotions, biases. So the questions goes to uh, Japanese speakers. Chinese and the Japanese have different perceptions about uh, Japanese military behavior in the Second World War. And do we have any chance, uh, two countries, to find the background uh, in history studies? Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, question there. Thank you. Hosokli, a trade economist and a former a Swedish official. And um, my question is relating actually to where I come from, which is Europe. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here because from the perspective of the other side of the world, we are basically on, in China, Korean Peninsula, and Japan, we are basically looking at four princelings that inherited the powers, I'm being a devil's <coughs> advocate, and basically, by our standards, they are all extreme right parties. There is no liberal option from the scale of Europe. 
And despite this, and what we have now heard about nationalism and the real militarization, it, it comes down to the pretty much to the clear point that f the, the important aspect for the, for the rest of the world is a question about uh, future multilateral governance and particularly the question of rule of law. Now, I think most Europeans would be inclined to basically align to China for mercantilist or historical reasons or for whatever reason it is. And I think a lot of Europeans would see that, you know, there are a lot of people, at least on this peninsula, who doesn't trust, you know, the Japanese even with water pistols. We get that message. But despite all this, we now come to the point that we, and also we have a strategic partnership with Korea, China and Japan. And despite all this, it comes down to the fact that there's only actually one party who is willing to settle territorial disputes through rule of law. And where Europe is basically rapidly declining as a future power, basically we can only operationalize one partnership, which is Japan, because we depend on rule of law. And I was just wondering, especially from the perspective of the Koreans and the Chinese uh, the, uh, panelists here, where do you see this as basically this development with national nationalism is actually driving a stronger bond between Japan with US and the EU? Thank you. And final comment over here. Well, I'm, I'm Chen Jung-woo, uh, senior advisor to ASEAN and uh, former national security advisor to President Lee myung bak And uh, I think I have just a, f uh, a couple comments. Uh, I think the, the cost of history, which is haunting this neighborhood has enormous power, a beastly power. And I think the, how we exercise this cost is going to be a daunting challenge for uh, regional security. And I want to comment on uh, uh, what Mr. Uh, Togo said about comfort woman, because I'm responsible for advising President Lee to focus on this issue in his uh, uh, summit with uh, uh, Prime Minister Noda uh, two years ago, uh, more than two years ago. So the reason I try to uh, tackle this issue is not because this is important, the most important issue, but because this is the, I thought this is the easiest issue to resolve if, if Japanese leadership, Japanese Prime Minister had uh, the political will, this would be the easiest issue we can resolve. Because territorial issue, doctor, history, they are too difficult to tackle. And nobody would uh, have a chance to resolve this issue you know, in one summit. And the reason we had to uh, resolve at least one, the least difficult issue was because the Lee myung administration was aiming at a fundamental upgrading of Korea-Japan relationship beginning with the uh, uh, cooperation in security area, beginning with the GISOMIA and uh, a logistic support agreement, and move on to uh, Korea-Japan bilateral FTA. These are, these are such a big pill to swallow for Korean general public. And we had to sweeten up uh, and prepare the ground to sell such very important uh, things to the hostile Korean domestic political market without resolution of the comfort woman case. I thought it would be very difficult to sell GISOMIA and other agreements with Japan. That's why we tried. We focused so much on comfort woman case. And I, I, this, this was a missed, an, missed opportunity to, to uh, put many other issues behind us and move toward uh, security cooperation between Korea and Japan. So I, yeah. I regret very much that Japan couldn't muster at the time the political determination to face up to, the, to this issue and, um, and put this behind us. Because I thought that Gono's statement, as you, as you rightly mentioned, Gono's statement already went as far as recognizing the involvement of the Imperial Army in the recruitment and in the operation of the comfort woman uh, houses. So I thought it would take only one more step to resolve this issue. And there have been many apologies on many issues lying between Korea and Japan, but the lack of sincerity in apologies, that 
was the biggest problem. And half-hearted apologies sometimes uh, are not you know, as good as the real apologies. So uh, if Japan could show a little more sincerity in their apologies, I think we, ha we could have resolved many, many problems that uh, stand in the way of any forward movement in Korea-Japan relations. Let me stop there. Okay, I'm being told we, we don't have more time, but if anyone wants to say something for 30 seconds, a couple of comments, we'll have them. Dr. Chun. Yeah, uh, it's about Ahn Jung-gun. I, I really uh, appreciate uh, Professor Togo's uh, view about that. Uh, but the question is the Japanese official, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, the, their response is uh, calling Ahn Jung-gun as a cri uh, criminal, right? So uh, the second thing is that, uh, you know, um, the Chinese uh, PRA haven't yet uh, conducted major operations, right? So if that is already be regarded as a 19th century imperialism, and you prepare to trade China uh, in, in that uh, spirit, then what you would expect from China? So I, I would really have the question. You look at the many, many major armies that are fighting wars all around the world. You want to see that the Chinese army also wants to fight uh, wars around the world, right? We haven't done that, but you label us as a 19th century imperialism. Uh, that was a huge mistake. Uh, the last thing is that, uh, Ralph, you know, can you say that, uh, what do you think the Japanese should say about uh, the Diaoyu Island? <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I think the Japanese should say exactly what I said, that, that Japan is willing to acknowledge that it is a disputed territory, if China is willing to acknowledge that they are under Japan's administrative control and that there has to be a peaceful solution. I think that's a win-win. For that to happen, both sides want to win. But right now, I think both leaders see it in their national interest to keep the tension. Uh, and, and that comes back to the point, last point that I wanted to make, which is leadership. Uh, we do a lot of conferences, US-Japan, US-Korea, and trilateral. Every meeting, it is unanimously agreed by Koreans and by Japanese that it is in both countries' national interest to have better relations between Japan and Korea. Everyone agrees with that, no question. Both also agree without question that the ball is in the other one's court. Uh, it's <laughs> the other one that has to, has to solve the problem. None are prepared to take the leadership uh, that is necessary to, to move forward. I think the comfort woman issue could be solved relatively easily if Korea were prepared to meet Japan halfway. What do I mean by that? The Japanese concern is not acknowledging the comfort woman. They've done that, the Kono statement. Their concern is reopening the whole reparations from World War II and undoing the, the agreements that have been done in the past. If it could be done on a humanitarian reason, we acknowledge that Japan has has met its obligations, but for humanitarian reasons, we would like to see a gesture for these women, and Japan did it for humanitarian reasons without opening up the legal Pandora's box. You could solve that, but that would require Korea to let Japan save face as well. Is Korea ready to do that? I, I, I don't know. How's it going? So, so uh, about An chung -gum. yes. When this issue of uh, Museum of Harping uh, emerged, uh, Suga, our cabinet general secretary, I think used the word of a criminal or terrorist, whatever. But he very quickly has withdrawn it. He's not repeating it. He's uh, stopped qualifying who is An chung -gun. And here, in my view, in my information, there is a clear learning process inside the Abe, gov Abe government. Uh, I cannot agree more with you that uh, comfort one issue is a relatively easy issue for us to resolve. <laughs> but uh, if the 100% responsibility of resolving issue lies uh, is al allo allocated, allocated to the Japanese side, then there is emerging some difficulty. So we need to talk and find a mutually accepted solution by the effort of both sides. Now, responding to your question, I think you asked me what is the background of uh, history issues coming up, coming back perpetually from the past? 
That's, I think that was your question. If that is so, I am very grateful for your interest. Because uh, I don't have lengthy time to explain, but from Japan's perspective, there is a very complicated and serious, uh, serious effort of soul searching. What was war? What was, our, what was wrong with us? And what could be defended? And so on and so forth. Just like in all other countries. This effort of soul searching is continuing in Japan. That sometimes mess up our message. It doesn't streamline our message as clearly as I want it. I think Murayama's statement is the is a, is a height of Japan's post-war apology position. I think this has to be made, made abundantly clear and, and, and strengthened. But some others do not agree with me. And so there may be some conflicting message emerging. But, uh, but you know, this shows how the issue of soul searching is very complex and difficult, even in Japan. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers.